collect that data, analyze that data, come up with solutions around that data, and then engage everybody in your organization in coming up with ways to either implement or make those solutions better or share the data with them and let them be a part of the solution process too, because you're not the only brain in the room. So share that information, use it to make decisions on what you want to train your team, what your leaders need to embrace. How are you going to create culture around that? Hello, and welcome to a whole new episode of Engati CX. I'm your host, Kimberly, and we are really glad to have all of you join us today. On this show, we talk to CX and technology experts from around the world. We explore, uncover, and share fresh insights on creating experiences that your customers will remember and look forward to. Engati is the world's leading multilingual, no-code digital CX platform available across 14 channels with 45,000 solutions created across 186 countries in every domain and use case. Engati has also been recognized as the top platform by Inc. Magazine, Tech World, CIO Magazine, and many others. We run the Engati blog, video channel, and the Engati CX podcast, receiving upwards of 400,000 visitors annually. And now for our guest. Tony Johnson is the founder and chief customer success officer at Ignite Your Service Training and Consulting. He is an expert on leading teams on the front line while developing services and guest experiences that inspire cultural shifts within large and complex organizations. He develops programs, processes, and accountability tools to inspire guest-centric thinking and believes in the power of people to deliver amazing service, care, and results. Welcome to the show, Tony. We're so glad to have you. I was so glad to be invited. Thanks for having me today. But before we dive into our amazing interview with Tony, don't forget to subscribe to Engati and tap the bell icon to get access to exclusive content coming from thought leaders around the globe. So, well, Tony, let's dive into our interview. We would like to know, as per your expertise, in the creation of voice of customer systems and CX uh, measurement mechanisms, is it mandatory for all businesses? Yeah, it's so important that people hear customers. I think that's why VOC or voice of the customer programs are so important. And again, there's great technology platforms out there. There's great systems that can be used, but it's a combination of all kinds of different listening posts. You've got to use the, the technology that's available, make it very simple, make it easy to get to. But you also have to make sure that you're using face-to-face communication, that you're using follow-up, that you're getting both score-based, you know, quantitative pieces, but also qualitative and verbatim responses, because all of that creates some color commentary and some and a full picture of your organization where you are. Because without knowing where you are, how will you ever get to where you want to be? So I think that's why it's just so mandatory that every company hears their customers. And again, whether it's on the back of a cocktail napkin, you know, or through something more evolved, uh, you know, such as a, a CX or VOC platform, it's so very important because you can't improve upon what you can't measure. Correct. I completely agree with you. And now that you've said it is very essential for every business, is uh, how can a company, if wants to come up with a voice of customer program, what according to you would be the three initial measures to start with? Well, I think you have to decide what you want to learn first. What do you want to measure? You know, so you, it may be CSAT, it may be OSAT, overall satisfaction, net promoter score. You may want to make sure you're capturing verbatims, but what do you want to learn about your customers uh, and, and, and what do you want to then be able to improve upon? So you have to decide there first. And, and then you have to remember that there's no wrong way to hear a guest. I already started by talking about that, but customers, consumers, guests, uh, patient experience is so very important. There is no wrong way to hear your constituents. You just have to take the time to do it. And the final piece is understand how your customers want to be communicated with. Do they value face-to-face? Do they value a phone call? Do they value uh, quick and easy online responses? Is an app mandatory? Do they prefer desktop? Do you have a constituency out there? Because remember your demographics and your personas, do you still have a clientele that really likes physical comment cards and face-to-face touches? I always think about the restaurant manager that's walking around and talking to people at tables and things like that. Again, that's as important as well. So don't abandon the what may seem more, more tactical, less tech-enabled, because it's a great complement to a technology-enabled piece when it comes to establishing your VOC parameters. I completely agree with you, Tony. Like you said, uh, 
it's it's very essential for businesses to actually know your customer and how they they want to be uh, communicated with like there are different type of com- uh, companies where you have customers they want to like they like online tools more compared to getting on a call or you know uh, having a one on one conversation they would like it to be digital so i completely agree to what you said uh, talking about customer journey maps how many customer journey maps does a company actually need do we need a customer journey map for every customer category or persona you know i think that's a great question because sometimes it's 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 easy to get down into the muck when it comes to journey mapping it's easy to to really get stuck in the weeds with that i think the first thing you have to ask is what are your key personas you know you do need a persona for the main channels of your organization but please don't think that you need 100 or 1000 or a million personas you just don't it, it's important also to understand that when you're doing journey and touch point and empathy mapping not every piece is the most important you can't own every piece of the journey you want to think about it you want to consider it you want to you know remove friction wherever possible but if you start to think about every step of a journey you're you're, you're absolutely going to lose your mind doing it so dialing in on where you get the most bang for your buck the most roi along that journey and what's most important to your customers because that is where organizations often lose focus they often start to look at things from their point of view as an organization as opposed to using the customer lens the customer point of view that outside in approach and so you know i, I think about the airline industry a lot you know they may have 100 different personas that travel with them but if you think about it you you've got business travelers you've got people who travel for leisure you've got people who travel a lot and people who don't travel very often at all and and you got some folks who travel as a mix of business and pleasure that's a pretty good start and every one of them has a different need from arriving at the airport to checking in to understanding how to board a plane and every one of those folks also needs more information or less information depending on their experience level so when you take that point of view you can automatically spot people who need help you can find frictions and hassles and just slap them right out of a customer's way and it positions you uniquely to make it easy to do business with you which is exactly what your customer uh your your competitors don't want you to do right so that is i think the end all be all of journey mapping is knowing just enough learning just enough experiencing just enough about your customers so that you can make it easy and make it really hard for them to want to do business with anybody else well said tony uh, uh, you spoke about key personas being a very important factor can you elaborate more on it and give us a few examples I'm sorry, say that again of of what? Key personas. So when I think about key personas, you know again it's kind of like when I when I came back to my airline example, I think you have to look at your business and say okay, these are the 3 or 5 or 10 personas that are 80 to 90% of my business or 80 to 90% of your potential prospects and look at things from their point of view or as you're segmenting your your voice to the customer data Hopefully you're getting some demographic data there too and you can see who your key personas are but the great part about that is if you're using a tool to segment your VOC data then you can say oh my gosh this one persona is is a pretty large part of our business but they're feeling underserved so to go back to the airline analogy you you may be analyzing your your personas and realize that although you've implemented all of these kiosk systems and self service processes you know you may find that half of your your travelers love it because they're seasoned travelers and they get it but folks like i have folks in my family who don't travel very often they get flummoxed when they see those kiosks because how do you print your bag tag where is it maybe the last time they traveled there wasn't a kiosk they have to fix their own bag tag and figure out where to drop their bag you may find that segment needs the most help so that's where i always like to look is are there any personas you know that i've developed you know then and again just talking about the key constituencies or customer channels are there any that are feeling underserved neglected or just feel like there's way too much friction in their experience go attack those first because you'll find then you can really attack their loyalty make sure they're not going to leave you and and understand where they're coming from so that you can help them win and solve their problems correct yes uh now that we have all of what our customer needs in place what are some tips in developing and implementing an effective organizational customer experience strategy here you know that's that's a wonderful question because i feel like this is where we start talking about real world and and that is one of the things i'm most passionate about when i help organizations often you know because the great news is most organizations have 
a reasonable customer experience strategy. They have a reasonable way to hear their customers. But what they really don't do well is taking all the data they hear and figuring out what to do next with it. And so when, when you want to think about implementing your system, go beyond just collecting data. Don't be a data clearinghouse. Think about how you can take that data and do something with it. It could be around training programs. It could be around implementing a pre-shift meeting or huddle strategy. You know, if you've ever worked for a restaurant or watched the Apple store before they open up or to go back to airlines, uh, the TSA have great pre-shift huddles before their shift changes. So you can decide what you want to go and attack, what you want to do with, with that information, but you have to translate that into action. If customers are telling you that your online check-in process is no good, you got to look at that. If they're telling you that your employees aren't offering them upsells or solving their problems the first time they call into your contact center, you've got to go after that. So don't just shove that information in a desk drawer. Take the time to use it to get better. Yes. So, Tony, uh, when do businesses actually start to get this hint that they need to change their strategies? Because what we do is we have uh, our uh, customer data, we have uh, our goals and missions of the company in place. But when do you think it's time to change these strategies? Well, I think your customers are going to tell you that. Your customers are going to let you know, your guests are going to let you know when something needs to change. Now, you should be ahead of the curve because you want to be, I hate saying proactive versus reactive because it is a $50 phrase everyone likes to say. But if you watch what I like to think of as your leading indicators, right? If you watch sales growth, if you watch uh, incremental sales, if you watch uh, overall customer loyalty, you're going to absolutely find that your customers are going to tell you when you need to do something different. And, and I think that's what, what organizations have to ultimately do is think about what those changes are and make sure that the changes they're making are targeted in a way because budgets are limited. So that's why the VOC segmented data and why analyzing your overall responses and, and looking at your data in aggregate as, as, as well as getting focused on certain segments will help you spend your, your limited budgets and think about change efforts in a much more meaningful way. But, but using data, using customer commentary, using their direction to drive results is much better than the scattershot approach that I've seen in many corporations over the, over the course of my time consulting and speaking and training, because you can't make these decisions in a vacuum in a conference room. You've got to have data and customer analytics to help you drive decisions. Very true. Now that we have all of our things set up and our perfect strategy, I would like to know what is your perfect good recipe for a good B2B customer experience? Well, when I, when I think about a B2B customer experience, it, it comes back to being agile, solving problems, and listening. And, and I think right now we're in a place where, where your clients out there, and when I say you, I'm talking to everybody listening, their needs are changing. The needs of your clients and, and those you're working with in a B2B process are significantly different than they were a year ago, than they were six months ago. And that's going to be really important to understand when it comes to driving those successes. And so listening to what your customer, what your client's problems and needs are right now is really important because you want to adapt and respond quickly because the marketplace is continuing to evolve. And as, as you know, the world is continuing to think about what reopening looks like in, in a wider way. And I don't know what normal is going to look like. I like to think, you know, maybe more around familiar. It may look a little more familiar in the coming months as, as the vaccine rolls out and things like that. You want to be ahead of that curve. So understanding what the current problem state is and be a problem solver. You will never go wrong with thinking about solving problems. Yes, I think also now that we have our first digital transformation that has taken place because of COVID, I think most of our uh, businesses need, have, have got the need to, you know, make their reach a little more dynamic and try to know a little bit more about their clients, about their customers. Yeah, it's, it's an important thing to know them, not, not creepy know them, right? Where you're, where you're like, oh my gosh, you're going through my trash. But to, but to know them well enough to understand their problems. And, and honestly, I think clients are hungry for, for businesses to stop thinking that they know best and reaching to them and understanding. Because a great company, a great innovator does two things well. They are thinking about the, the curve. They are thinking about what's next. They are thinking about being, being first. Although, Honestly, being first, not nearly as important as being best, 
But when I think about that, it's important because then those companies will often reach their customers, have candid, open conversations where they're talking about what they need from each other, they're setting real, realistic expectations, and then plotting a path forward together. And I think that kind of collaborative process with a, with a sprinkling of innovation, just enough innovation to feel different from the market, that's where people are going to continue to win. Correct. I completely agree with you. You've said that. You've put that in a very good way. Uh, is there something else you would like to tell our audience? Is there something that we are missing out here? I'd like to just reiterate one of the most important things. I spent some time working for some really big companies as, as a customer experience professional. And, and I've also spent a lot of time working as a consultant and a trainer. And the one thing that I continue to see is hoarding data. You know, it, it, let me just tell everybody out there, if you are in charge of data and analytics, keeping data and analytics away from your leaders, away from your field locations, that's not power. That's, that's hoarding data in a way that's not going to help anybody. The power comes. If you want to be a, a leader in customer experience, collect that data, analyze that data, come up with solutions around that data, and then engage everybody in your organization in coming up with ways to either implement or make those solutions better or share the data with them and let them be a part of the solution process too, because you're not the only brain in the room. So share that information, use it to make decisions on what you want to train your team, what your leaders need to embrace. How are you going to create culture around that? You need to share that data out widely. Be the wise person in the room that's not just bringing numbers, but bringing context to data and bringing everybody together to find solutions. That truly is where CX professionals are going to shine in the coming year because customer experience professionals do one thing really well. They bring people together. They bring together HR and marketing and operations and deployment and logistics and senior leadership and frontline employees. You can bring them all in and give them a big old CX hug and help them drive forward for their customers. And that's the power of having a really great coalition building customer experience officer, director of customer service, VP of customer, whatever you call it. But really great people in that, in that discipline do that really well. They unite and find problem solving solutions. Yes, I think that has given me a new perspective to looking at customer experience. And I'm going to keep this for me. And I'm sure our audience is going to enjoy this interview as much as I did. And they're going to take out all the beautiful tips that you've given to us about businesses. Thank you so much, Tony, for giving us your time, your insights. Oh, it was a pleasure. Like your, your insights were really precious. And I know our audience is going to enjoy this interview. Thank you so much for having me. It was a great conversation. And, you know, all I can say for 2021 and beyond is go CX, all right? We'll see you back with a new episode and a brand new expert. So stay tuned and we'll see you around for the next one.